Welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we're excited to have Donald Green from Columbia. We'll speak about using placebo controlled designs to detect edutainment effects and spillovers results from a two large scale experiments in Uganda. Uh, Donald Green uh, will stop from time to time to uh, take questions. In uh, Q&A, we have support from Anna Wilkie. Um, after the talk, we will have a discussion by Molly Alpha Westford. Uh, questions today will be handled by Guillaume, so I'm handing over to him now. Thank you, Dominique. Um, so as Dominique said, um, today Anna will be um, handling the Q&A, so please do submit your questions. Uh, Don will uh, pause from time to time, uh, so we will select a few questions and ask them live. If your question is selected, I will ask you to uh, raise your hand and um, I will unmute you. So um, please don't raise your hand um, until I've asked you to do so. All right, that's all from me. Uh, Don, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thanks. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Let me get my slides together. Go. The right, the right thing going. I hope you can see them now. Um, in fact, let me, I think yeah. I'm not in the main one. There we go. That's better. Um, this is joint work with uh, my two amazing uh, co-authors, Anna Vilke, who will be doing the Q&A, and uh, Jasper Cooper, who couldn't make it because he's in New Zealand. It's a little bit uh, past his bedtime now. Um, both outstanding researchers in the field, technically outstanding writers, and it's just a pleasure to um, be part of this project with them. Um, and we're very grateful to Molly Offer Westert for offering her, uh, her comments. It's very uh, kind of her to take the time out to prepare uh, uh, comments, and you'll see that they're quite trenchant and interesting. Um, this is a, a rather different kind of causal inference seminar talk in that it's not uh, primarily about the, the kind of statistical analysis of an unruly experiment. It, it's sort of the opposite. It's, it's trying to um, make a difficult question easier by doing a lot of front end work on the design side. And so um, basically what I'll be doing in this talk is kind of unfolding the, the design ideas for you, and then we'll pause for questions, but really you should feel free to interrupt with questions uh, at any time if you have them. Um, we'll take a pause before we see the results. We'll see the results and then uh, uh, turn it over to, uh, to the discussant. Um, I wanna be mindful of the time. Um, at the same time, I wanna make sure that your, uh, your questions get answered. So if you have them, please jump right in. The, the background for this, is, the substantive background for this, is um, basically the uh, causal role of what might be called edutainment, uh, education entertainment or entertainment education, either one. Um, the idea of uh, convincing people about facts or convincing people about values, changing their attitudes, changing their, their willingness to act through narratives, through entertainment, um, as opposed to straight ahead, you know, you ought to do this kind of uh, injunctions. Um, there's a quite large literature on this involving many, many large-scale randomized trials, and I've just thrown on the slides a few uh, smatterings of examples here. One would be the classic uh, uh, Rwanda randomized trial done by Betsy Levy Palak, uh, looking at a placebo controlled comparison between two radio programs. One, Museka Wea, which was basically a kind of a, uh, you know, a kind of a Shakespearean tale of, you know, Romeo and Juliet uh, set with uh, Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda um, against uh, an HIV oriented placebo control design. Um, in India, there, there, there were studies on um, anti-vote buying messages on radio or films depicting iodine salt. Um, in Nigeria, which is in some sense going to um, inspire some of the projects that we'll talk about at the end of this talk that we're now doing in Tanzania, um, Abhijit Banerjee, uh, Eliana LaFerrara, and Victor Orozco uh, did a quite nice study of the effects of the Suga uh, MTV series focusing on HIV-related themes. Um, and you'll see that whereas we are going to look at social spillovers in a very general way, they're actually going to delve deeply into uh, social networks, friend networks, and, and so on. And that's what we're going to do in uh, our Tanzania study that I'll talk about at the end, uh, which contrasts two uh, radio soap operas, one involving early enforced marriage and the other 
on the HIV stigma. Um, there, we're going to track down the friends, the, the, the spouses, the, the children, and see if we can detect spillovers. So um, it's a very large literature. And the idea of it is, um, you know, you need that narrative element in order to have large enough effects to detect. Uh, interestingly, when you look at this literature, um, there isn't a lot of head-to-head -head competition uh, between narrative and non-narrative persuasion. And to the extent that there is, uh, it tends to favor uh, narrative persuasion, but it's not a deep literature that way. But it does seem quite common to have um, RCTs that fail to produce uh, effects, even when they're repeated ad nausea in front of uh, large audiences. Just, you know, it's hard to get, get traction in getting people to change their attitudes and behaviors without a, a narrative element. Um, there is quite a lot of, you know, circumstantial evidence to suggest that spillovers would be plausible in the context of, say, East Africa, um, where, you know, you have on the one hand, direct survey evidence suggesting that a very large proportion of people who see some kind of edutainment program report in some subsequent unrelated survey that uh, they did talk about it. So the transmission mechanism seems to be present. Um, moreover, if we're talking about rural East Africa, um, we're talking about you know places where people stay put. You know, most of the villagers we interviewed had spent all of their adult lives. The median person spent all their adult life um, in the village, and many of them have spent all their, their lives, period, in the village. Um, they claim to know most people in the village, if not everybody. And uh, so it's a relatively dense and tightly knit uh, social network. Um, but most importantly, when you're talking about, say, East Africa um, or rural Africa more generally, you're talking about people who do not have uh, a, 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 let's say a fulsome media diet. Um, they tend not to uh, own televisions. And so for them to see um, something that involves films or TV-like uh, videos um, is a bit of a novelty. And so to the extent that um, Western-oriented edutainment um, uh, RCTs have failed to produce direct effects, it's in part perhaps due to the fact that uh, people are already kind of chock full of, of it edutainment or entertainment in general. And this doesn't really have an opportunity to, to, uh, to kind of rise to the top of mind. Um, there are, however, an enormous array of methodological challenges uh, confronting, uh, you know, stalwart randomistas like us um, as we try to measure the effects, direct or spillover effects of edutainment. Um, Fundamentally, there's a, a, a non-compliance problem. Now, many, many uh, experiments on media solve the non-compliance problem by basically uh, doing lab in the field type studies. They will present somebody point blank with a, a, some kind of media uh, presentation and ask them point blank what they think. And it's not at all unobtrusive or subtle. And we're not doing that. We're sort of moving the opposite direction from that. So we're going to try to do this in a naturalistic uh, setting and try to separate the exposure to the treatment from the measurement of outcomes, which are often kind of concatenated in the typical lab-like design. Um, and if we're going to detect both the direct effect on the compliers, the people who uh, would watch if and only if they're a side watch, um, and the diffusion effects on others, uh, you know, we're going to have to either do it through a clever design, or we're going to have to make lots of ad hoc assumptions um, about, you know, a, a, about the effects on never takers and so on. So we're, we're, we're trying to avoid, or not, not, we can't avoid all possible assumptions, but we're going to try to minimize uh, those kinds of assumptions and try to make as much of the design do the work as possible. So then, um, in addition, we'd like to have the design have reasonable power. So it has to be done on a fairly large scale, particularly as you'll see when we're talking about a randomized trial that is cluster randomized at the village level, we're gonna need a lot of clusters. And so as you'll see, as the talk unfolds, there will be a pilot study with 56 clusters, 56 trading centers, and then there's gonna be a, a full study of 112. So it's going to be quite a big uh, production to actually get this into the field. Um, and then, you know, we'd like to have the outcomes be unobtrusively measured, or at least relatively unobtrusively. No, no survey measure can be perfectly unobtrusive. Um, so our idea is to have the survey takers 
not not survey people as they leave uh, the exposure to the media, but rather have an unrelated village level survey two months later and then eight months later. So this is going to be you know, a study that bends over backwards to sever any apparent connection between the intervention on the one hand and the outcome measurement on the other. Um, and, you know, we want to do this kind of delayed, you know, multi-layer uh, measurement in order to see if we can uh, detect sustained effects, because um, the question is, to what extent uh, do these effects uh, persist, not only spill over, but just persist. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about uh, entertainment is that, you know, we could probably all think of shows that we saw that still resonate with us, still have memories imprinted on us from when we were children. So it's not impossible to, to think that these kinds of effects uh, would persist um, over time, particularly when people are not exposed to many competing messages um, that might either distract them or um, counter, counter what they've already heard. So we're going to do two randomized trials, uh, one in 2015, one in 2016. Um, they're going to be cluster randomized at the level of the so-called trading center. So these are very rural areas, uh, as I'll describe in just a moment. And a trading center is basically, you know, like two, two unpaved roads that cross. And typical um, in East Africa and, and apparently in other areas of Africa as well are these institutions called um, uh, bibandas, which are basically um, video halls. You know, they're like a little tiny movie theater. Um, now, typically what happens in those places is that um, men congregate to watch either kung fu movies or, or you know, soccer. Um, and the price of admission is something like um, five cents, 10 cents in American currency. Um, so it's a, a relatively inexpensive thing, even for people with very little income. Um, but the idea is to transform these into more kind of canonical Western movie theaters. And you'll see that that's how it's going to go. We're going to have a, a, a free multi-week weekend uh, film festival, four consecutive weekends in, in the first uh, pilot study, six consecutive weekends in the full-blown study, during which we show feature-length Western movies. So Slumdog Millionaire or Pirates of the Caribbean and so on and so forth. Um, and we you know, are going to attract a crowd um, and we're going to randomly embed in the movie uh, commercial breaks. So it'll be very, very Americanized in that sense. Um, we were going to uh, basically have the natural pauses in those, those movies and insert a, a little three-part vignette. Um, and what will those three-part vignettes be? Well, I'll tell you in just a moment, but the idea is um, we're going to essentially have a three-cornered uh, randomized trial with three different messages. Each will be essentially the placebo to the other's treatment. And so the, the idea here is to get a three-for-one deal where we uh, conduct an experiment, but we simultaneously gauge the effects of multiple film, multiple, sorry, multiple commercial vignettes um, on different outcome measures. Um, this is a design that I think has always been kind of out there ready for the taking, but um, it's, it's seldom used. And so I think that's, it, it's not strictly speaking an innovation, but it is something that isn't used very much. And so it's, it's as though we're, we're tuning up an old instrument and, and playing it again. Um, the messages, and this is rather important for understanding the point of the study, the messages are going to be filmed in the native language of Luganda. Okay, they're gonna be filmed on location by you know, really high quality actors and really high production value producers. So this is really gonna be fundamentally different from anything that a typical villager would ever see. I mean, um, essentially there, there are no um, media of this sort. Um, and so the, the idea that uh, you know, you're, you're going to be watching essentially an overdubbed Western film, and then there's going to be this interlude that's going to be in Luganda is going to be a little akin to this scene in The Wizard of Oz, where you go from uh, black and white to color. Um, so the, it's going to, to resonate in a way that we might not ordinarily appreciate if we were just kind of hearing about the design. So that's, that's the idea. Um, and the setting is Uganda. It's going to be rural Uganda. So if this is Kampala, this is kind of the this city center. Um, we're nowhere near the city center. If you take one of these roads out here and go off the beaten path to one of these villages, um, there's no 
electricity, there's no running water, you know, there, the, there's no pavement. It, it's essentially, you know, uh, 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 it's not a desperately poor area because Uganda is not desperately poor, but it's, it's poor. Um, you know, about half the, the rural population sub subsists on about three, three US dollars a day. So not, not desperately poor by the standards of Niger or other really poor countries, but, but not affluent either. And so we're talking about a, a setting where maybe one out of four households has a television and maybe seven out of eight households uh, have, a, have a radio, um, but it's not, there's, there's not a, lot, a whole lot of assets beyond that. So we're going to do, you know, round one and round two, we're going to group the villages um, more or less by, you know, region, and then we're going to randomly assign them in ways that I'll describe in a moment. Um, but the, the basic setup is, uh, this will be a randomized trial where the thing that is randomized is the vignettes that are inserted into the feature length films. Um, just to give you a bit of background on, on the dependent variables that we're going to measure during the, during the study, um, you know, there are going to be three. So the first one is about, you know, topics related to gender-based violence, uh, intimate partner violence or violence against women. Those are, those are terms that we'll use more or less interchangeably here. Um, you'll see that this is a, a, a international survey uh, and it's done in a way that allows you to compare uh, Uganda to uh, many other countries uh, around the world. And what's interesting about Uganda is that like some of the most conservative countries on earth, um, a large proportion of women um, believe that a man is justified for beating his wife if she does one of the following things. And they give a, they give a bunch of scenarios. And the question is, do you say that any of them are justified? And so um, it's quite common to uh, even, and I, I didn't necessarily believe this when I when I first started studying this. And, and I, so I did some, you know, interviews, depth interviews with, through a translator. And, um, you know, there was absolutely this view. Um, so it's really quite, quite interesting that, you know, women and men uh, believe that, you know, violence against women has a kind of pedagogic value. They don't believe in severe violence, and that's going to be an important theme for the, the content of the show. Um, so they don't believe that you should do something more than slap, but they, they do believe that, you know, you should teach a woman to behave properly. So that's, that's the conservatism that makes Uganda famous um, uh, on violence against women, it's also very, very conservative on the issue of abortion. Um, and it, it ranks among, you know, maybe the three or four most conservative countries on earth in that way. Um, now, we're not going to try to change views about abortion more generally, but we're going to try to um, reduce the stigma associated with seeking medical attention in the wake of, uh, of a, an abortion that leads to medical complications, um, which is a, a prominent cause of death among uh, women in Uganda. Um, they're not seeking uh, medical attention and um, they die of an infections and complications. And then the last of the policy problems is teacher absenteeism. This slide basically summarizes the fact that teacher absenteeism is incredibly common in, uh, in Uganda um, and uh, shows no signs of subsiding. It's, it's very bad there and um, you know, there have been a lot of randomized trials on it. Essentially what we're doing is asking, you know, to what extent can you change uh, parents' views about whether you should take action on this policy problem, as opposed to do things that involve temporizing in different ways, like moving to another village or sending your kids to a different village or taking them out of school entirely. So I mentioned that, um, that uh, we, in collaboration with um, screenwriters uh, and local actors, produced a series of vignettes. So these are, these are written by Ugandan uh, screenwriters and they're using Ugandan actors and you know basically they take place in villages and it's a very unusual kind of thing um, and I think it has a lot of extra resonance but the the basic idea is we um, worked with Peripheral Vision International to produce these videos um, they created them and they become part of the commercial breaks um, because we have th three-part video uh, we can't really do this through with more than uh, two topics. We just can't cram nine different commercial breaks into a 
feature film uh, length show. So we only use at most two, and that'll have implications for the design uh, later and the analysis as well. But the, the basic idea is that these are, these are going to be um, sort of a story within a story, and uh, they're going to dramatize um, either, for example, uh, the girl who is found by her aunt, she's dying of a post-abortion infection. She, you know, she explains what the situation is, takes her, you know, take the, the aunt uh, basically rescues, rescues her, takes her to the doctor for antibiotics, and the doctor explains that this kind of thing happens all the time. So the basic idea is, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't jar, judge a girl so harshly that we basically consign her to death when uh, she's too uh, ashamed to come out and so on. So those are the kinds of messages that are in there. And of course, they're in the, the links of the paper. Uh, um, you'll see that there, there are places where you can watch the uh, English subtitle version of these uh, videos if you like. So to summarize then, we're going to have um, some villages that are going to get no commercial breaks. They're just going to watch the film. In some villages, they're just going to get a one tripart uh, set of commercial breaks, either on abortion stigma or violence against women or teacher absenteeism, or they'll get twos, but they won't get all three because that just be too many interruptions. Um, and because of the, you know, the, the, the slight in asymmetry, because we don't have a triple, um, we have a little bit of a, an extra assumption that has to be built into uh, our analysis that there, there are no uh, special uh, cross effects. And I think that it sort of stands to reason. I don't see why um, watching a show on teacher absenteeism would have any implications for what you think about either the other issues or vice versa. Um, other noteworthy features of the design. So again, as I say, this is not a study that um, presents people with media and then interviews people right then and there. In fact, we don't do anything uh, to, to measure what people are doing then and there. Um, we, we simply come back without a baseline survey. So we're coming back for the first time uh, with, a, with a midline survey, essentially, uh, that's a general population survey of the village. It does not focus on the people who went to the shows and just asks at the very end um, whether they went to the shows in ways that I'll describe in just a moment. So in other words, we're going to have a random sample of the village. And within that random sample, there will be some different types. There will be compliers, the people who go to the show, whatever it is. Um, so they're going to see the commercial breaks because they're attracted to the film. No one's going, I, I think, to the film, or at least we're not, we're assuming no one goes to the film to see the commercials. Um, they're going to be people we call a prize never takers, uh, but they could just be called the people who are indir indirectly reached. So they're the people who are friends or family with somebody who went to the show but did not go themselves. So conceivably, they could get some, some of the secondhand input from the show. Um, or they could just be kind of pure never takers. They're just not, not, they didn't go to the show. They don't know anybody went to the show. And so uh, we could be super agnostic and merge those two groups together and just call them never takers. Or we can look at, at these kinds of gradations. So that's essentially our, our approach. Um, and the, the idea is to measure outcomes with respect to each of the three issue areas so that we essentially have a three for one kind of randomized trial. So uh, to summarize that, we're going to have three different interventions that are all going to be the placebos to each other's treatment. We're going to have three different set of outcome measures um, going on simultaneously. And we're going to have three different strata, um, the compliers, the apprised never takers, and the uh, pure never takers. Um, now, in order to pull off a design like this, you must preserve the symmetry uh, at all levels of, uh, of implementation. So you can't flag for people anything about the commercial breaks when you're advertising the shows and you can't um, do anything differently in the way, in the timing of your outcome measurement. So, so this graph simply shows that the timing of outcome measurement was uh, scrupulously identical um, for all the villages regardless of their treatment assignment. Moreover, and this is this comes maybe as a shock to those of, if, of you who, like me, you know, have done a lot of survey research in Western countries, um, the response rate is well, well, well above 90%. So there's almost no attrition here. Um, in fact, 90% is sort of an understatement. It's, it's close to like 98%. Um, so what's kind of interesting about this is that the, this is not a, an area where people have been surveyed to death. They're, 
they're very often surveyed, almost always surveyed for the first time. And um, I might add parenthetically that it is for most respondents an interesting survey because it covers a lot of different topics that are part of their daily lives. So this is not a survey of the sort that they often resist, which is, you know, how many cows do you have? How many goats do you have? What kind of roof do you have? Because they think you're a tax assessor. This, this doesn't deal with any assets. This just asks them about their opinions. And for many people, it's the first time anyone's ever asked them about what they think. So it's kind of, kind of cool that way. Okay, now a key design as assumption, and we're gonna get ready to pause here for, for questions and concerns, um, is that you know, attendance is gonna be unrelated to the treatment condition. Now this is gonna have testable implications. In other words, they should, the, the respondents should have the same background attributes regardless of, of whether um, they attend a show in a village that gets teacher absenteeism type uh, commercials as opposed to violence against women commercials that should have nothing to do with uh, with why they came to the show so the idea then is um, these kinds of assignments should essentially be uh, unrelated to to uh, potential outcomes um, now it's got to be you, you got to implement this in a way so that the messages are not part of the recruiting and so we did there's nothing about um, about recruiting that, that even mention the, the commercials, nor would I think um, they'd be something one would ordinarily mention. Um, and we try to be super discreet in the way that we uh, bring up uh, attendance of the show to, to figure out what stratum a, a respondent is in. Um, we're gonna ask them at the very end of the midline survey, um, questions like this. Uh, recently, a series of six free films, this is the second study, six free films, um, were screened in the Chibanda in your trading center. Have you heard about the, the screenings? And if so, how many screenings did you attend? So in other words, the very end, you've already established a lot of rapport with the, the respondent and just ask them about a recent event. And so all the outcome measures have been asked before, and this is simply to figure out um, whether they're a complier or not. And if, if they're not, um, you might ask, well, what about your friends and family? Um, and so on. So the idea is based on what they answer to that sequence of questions, we're going to classify them according to their stratum. And here's something about the background characteristics of the stratum. Now we have an oversample of men to begin with, um, because we're, we sort of thought that men would be the ones we'd most want to target uh, with messages about violence against women. Um, but we have a lot of women, um, and women don't ordinarily go to uh, these kinds of video halls, but we, you know, we made it free and we made a special point of inviting them. You can see that about 25% of the men we interviewed in the uh, post-treatment survey are compliers. They're gonna, they're gonna, they went to at least one show, as opposed to about 12% of the women. So uh, attendance is much more common among men than women. And that stands to reason both in terms of the social roles that uh, Chibanda play, but also, you know, the average woman in this area um, has six children. So it's rather difficult for them to uh, peel off and, and go to this kind of thing. Um, this also gives you some background information about the kinds of people who showed up. Um, you were less likely to show up if you already had a television. Um, you can see that about, you know, seven eighths of the men have, have a radio, not so much for the women. Um, again, it's not a desperately poor area, but it's it's certainly not affluent either. Now, the testable design assumptions, and these are in the, you know, in the JRSS paper, um, you know, it, it basically, these are tests of whether you have a similar uh, distribution of, of background attributes across conditions, and uh, fortunately you do. Um, and you, also, you know, basically you're saying, look, it's, it's as though people show up to a film and then are, are or they are their village more, more accurately, their village is, um, is randomly assigned to, uh, to whatever uh, condition they get, um, one set of videos or another. So this will be the last slide before I pause for questions. So we're gonna try to estimate the causal effect on average for compliers. So that's the usual late or CACE. Um, and the idea of our pre-analysis plan was to say, look, if we get an effect among the people who show up, um, then we'll start to look for spillovers. Because presumably, if there's no effect on the people who show up, it's hard to imagine how they would transmit it to other people. Um, and so that's the that's the the underlying idea. Um, there is a multiple comparisons issue. I think it's it's de minimis in this case, but we can talk about it. Um, 
And the idea here is we're going to look for spillover effects by looking at, for example, apprised never takers, people who knew about uh, the show insofar as they had friends or family who attended but did not attend themselves. We're going to compare, say, them in the pure control condition to the violence against women condition or in the teacher absenteeism condition to some other condition and so on. So we're going to try to detect whether they move, and in particular, whether they move on the relevant issues that were that were presented um, in the uh, commercial videos that they saw. So we're going to do that, and we're going to do hypothesis testing using randomization inference, taking into account the uh, cluster design, and that's that's basically the the setup. And I'm about to present results, but. Um, Dominic and others advise me we should stop for questions. And so I want to be mindful of the time and stop for questions. How are we doing? Yeah, we're doing fine. We're right on time. Thanks, Don. Um, so we, we do have a, a, a few uh, questions from anonymous attendees. So I will, I will ask them um, myself. So one question is, um, why do you need villages who see more than one commercial? I think it's because we wanted to squeeze as much out of the the um, you know this RCT as possible. We wanted to have um, multiple treatments and have multiple outcomes. And the only limiting factor was how many uh, treatments we could administer in the context of say, you know, a, a film. I see. Thanks. Um, another question is: What is the correspondence between your self-report outcome, uh, self-reported outcome uh, measure, and actual uh, changes behavior. So I guess the, the question is whether uh, you were able to actually check whether behavior was changed beyond self-report. It's a great question. Um, in, the con in the context of a different paper, um, the one that appeared in Comparative Political Studies, we try to look not only at um, uh, attitudes about uh, violence against women and so-called conations or conative attitudes about violence against women, whether you're willing to help somebody who's been battered, for example. Um, we also do a survey eight months later to gauge from women, it's a very delicate matter, of course, um, whether there has been violence in their own household. And so that actually, to our surprise, shows an effect. Um, so for those, those results, please uh, see the uh, Comparative Political Studies paper. Happy to send on the, the, um, the citation. For the uh, absenteeism items, we, ju we just weren't set up to, to go to schools and to really do a, a careful uh, outcome monitoring, but we did um, ask uh, teachers who were in our sample of whether this actually um, occurs, and there was some, and we also asked parents, There's and we, and we also asked the, the village health team, and there's some glimmer of an effect there, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think this, this study is actually set up to do a proper RCT on teacher absenteeism, but I, I definitely want to go back and do it. In fact, I'd like to use the same video um, to see whether um, if you specifically sampled high absenteeism schools, whether this had any detectable effect. And then I don't know about the uh, abortion stigma one. I don't know what kind of outcome we would measure there. Um, it's uh, such a delicate subject. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, another uh, a couple of clarifying questions. So one is, um, so some, some individuals may go to more than one film uh, in the festival and so see more than one, um, you know, pairs of ads, I guess, even if it's the same, but like they may be exposed to the same advertisement uh, commercial multiple times. So there's kind of a, um, a dose uh, response kind of uh, situation here. Is that something that you're, you have investigated at, at all in the, um, in the paper? Well, we, we haven't investigated it much in part because, you know, if we were to imagine, you know, say Anna goes twice and I go three times and you go once, um, it's, you know, although we could ask whether the treatment was larger for you vis-a-vis -vis your three, two, or one counterfactual person in some other village, um, the dosage per se is not randomly assigned. And so it's a little bit hard to interpret that treatment by covariate interaction. Although I, I think it would be extremely interesting to, to literally vary that. You know, we could have uh, attempted to, um, to just, you know, uh, to, to do one uh, film, well, one week film festival in some places, a three week and a six week to see whether the repetition of the commercials had any enduring effect. 
makes sense. Thanks. Um, and finally, one uh, in in one previous slides, you mentioned that you're you're assuming that um, say seeing a commercial about abortion or about um, uh, yeah, for for instance, about uh, abortion does not have um, does not change an individual's view on teachers' absenteeism. Um, but isn't that something that you that is actually testable by by looking by comparing uh, the say the treatment conditions with the with the control group? Yes. Yes, um, okay. it's not easily testable, but it's it is testable, and um, okay. and you know I you, you're going to see so so many null findings here. You won't be shocked to know that um, <laughs> it's it's unlikely that those kinds of okay things. that makes sense. All right, thank you very much. I think you can you can continue, and uh, we'll see if there are more questions um, at the end. Great. Um, looks like we're we're good to go. We're right on schedule. So um, marching ahead. Uh, here, here are the outcome measures, and then we'll talk about the results. So as I, as I hinted in a previous answer to a question, um, one of our key outcome measures has to do with what might, might have been called in the 1970s, conative additives. Um, not, a, not a commonly used term, but it's, a, it's distinct from uh, the usual idea of an attitude. So an attitude is typically defined as, as an enduring predisposition to respond to a class of stimulus objects. But a conative attitude in particular focuses on your behavioral orientation. So are you willing to help a girl who has been battered? Um, are you willing to help a, you know, a, a person who is suffering a, a post-abortion complication and so on? So these are willingness to take action. Uh, they aren't necessarily behaviors, um, but they're different from attitudes about whether, say, abortion is right or wrong. In fact, quite different. Um, so the idea there is um, these these dramatizations are, are giving people a kind of script of the kinds of things that they could do or should do um, if they see a problem uh, unfolding in their village. Um, so one, one of our measures is going to be that. Uh, you'll see we have lots of measures of other things, but you know, not so many effects. So we don't, we're not going to find effects on um, attitudes about violence against women in general, about whether it's justifiable um, and so on. We're not going to see much change in other kinds of things having to do with you know whether you know abortion is justifiable certainly not so so we're going to focus on these kinds of conations for uh, purposes of the uh, spillover analysis there's another one that moves which is um, the priority given to educational goals um, that seems to be moved uh, quite substantially by the absenteeism treatment so we're going to pool across both studies, the 56 village study and 112 village study, where possible. Um, not possible for the violence against women study. I can go into that, uh, but we changed the videos because the first video just didn't seem to be getting us anywhere. Um, and we're going to follow the, our nose and look at some pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis within gender groups because you'll see that there's, you know, that, that was the right call. You'll see they're quite profound interactions in some cases. Okay, so here's what we mean by uh, measuring uh, conative attitudes. We give people basically a forced choice uh, kind of question. Uh, imagine that you find out that your child's teacher has been absent for two days this week during teaching hours. Suppose there are only two actions you could take. Please tell us which one you would prefer to take. And what we do is essentially have a random rotation of two different sets of four, uh, can, you know, four reasons to do something, four reasons to do nothing or temporize. And so that's the index we built as a four item index. Um, we do the same thing with conative attitudes about violence against women. Um, your cousin tells you that her husband has beaten her severely and asks for your help. So now there are two kinds of things that you could say to her. Uh, I would no notify the Navachala, which is the leader of the women and ask her to mediate or, and then some randomly assigned uh, inaction, like tell her that uh, beating is a sign of love or something like that. So the, the, the idea is we're going to, again, rotate through um, to create an index of things that you could do to take action or, or good excuses you could have to not do anything in particular. And the same goes for uh, abortion stigma. Um, again, we're going to rotate a whole bunch of reasons um, for what, what you would say to her, either uh, reasons that would be supportive or reasons that would basically be dismissive. So the overview of the results, in some sense, already foreshadowed this. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, there are going to be several instances of, of big effects, um, even when people are interviewed unobtrusively two months later or even eight months later. Um, but you came to a talk on spillovers, and there are no spillovers to show you. Um, but I'll, I'll show you that we have well-estimated zeros, um, and that's what I'll do next. 
Um, I'll also uh, show you that you get some really big eye-popping effects uh, with gender subgroups, especially women um, in some cases, but you still don't see much evidence of scrolls. So to give you some examples, um, here is the index of willingness to take action to counter absenteeism. And you know, basically moving people four or five percentage points on this per item index is a fairly substantial movement. It's the standard deviation at the village level is 0.11. So you're moving people about 40% of a village level standard deviation through a village level exposure to this kind of treatment. So it's having an effect on, on people's willingness to, you know, bring it up at the PTA and bring absenteeism up among other parents and take action. But no effect, no apparent effect among those who are reached indirectly, who had friends and family who attended but didn't attend themselves, or who didn't know about anything at all. Or if you pull the two groups, so if you pull columns two and three together to get column four, no effect. Um, if you ask, is education an important goal? The compliers are really moved on this. Uh, they, they go about a, a quarter of a standard deviation on this. Uh, there's no, no doubt about it. And uh, maybe there's a hint of a spillover for the reached indirectly, but really not, not much evidence if you were to pull everything together that anything traveled much uh, through the village. When you look at uh, violence against women, uh, you see a fairly substantial uh, direct effect among compliers. Uh, they become much more likely to uh, take action, you know, kind of pro, pro action uh, uh, to help a battered woman. Um, and it's, it's about a half a village standard deviation, but really no apparent uh, transmission to people who are friends or family with people who attended and those who weren't reached at all, no effect. What about post-abortion complications? Again, um, fairly substantial effect. Uh, it's maybe not as substantial, but it's about a quarter of a standard deviation at the village level. Um, no evidence that people who had friends or family who attended moved at all. What about the treatment by gender interaction? Well, if you look at how women are reacting to these, uh, these messages, especially violence against women and uh, abortion stigma, they are really moving. They are really moving a lot. Um, more than half of village standard deviation for the women. And you see not, not a whole lot of movement among the men. But when you look at other women who have friend, friends or family who attended, you know, even though the, the communication networks in villages are very stratified by gender, no apparent effect. Uh, similarly for uh, post-abort, uh, helping people with suffering from post-abortion complications, huge effect among women, but doesn't transmit to other women. So, the, in conclusion, you know, we have a, a placebo, a multi-message placebo control design um, that has different layers of uh, compliance strata. And we have robust evidence of uh, edutainment effect, not on the general attitudes, but on these uh, cognitive attitudes all, through all three um, issues, um, but very little evidence of a media-induced spillover. And so, you know, one, one question is, well, what, what if we had more micro evidence? And so one part of the Uganda study actually interviewed children of uh, the compliers, and there's only a tiny bit of evidence that, that anything spilled over to the children. Um, so now that we're, in, we're out of Uganda and in Tanzania, um, we've been doing many of the same edutainment experiments there, this time uh, focusing on uh, radio soap operas. Um, and we've been focusing in particular on a radio soap opera that discourages uh, early enforced marriage on the one hand um, versus another one that uh, the placebo control that is about HIV stigma. So these, this is again a placebo control design. This one is a more obtrusive design. So this is where you go in, do a baseline survey, recruit people to go to a screening and then um, let some time go by before you re-interview them. Um, and then interview their partners, interview their children, interview their friends. Um, and so it's, it's much more like the Banerjee et al. Nigeria study in that we're trying to get at the micro um, level evidence of, of spillovers as opposed to having a very, very light touch and just asking, can we detect spillovers in the air without necessarily um, digging very deeply into specific social networks? And you know, what's interesting there is we're, we're seeing you know, um, strong effects for, for the HIV uh, message, which is, you know, I guess the HIV message seems to be a winner cross-nationally, 
um, but not much in terms of the forced marriage uh, message, even though that produced quite substantial effects. So, so it does seem as though the message matters, and that's that's uh, why uh, we continue to plug away at this uh, quite challenging research design. Let me stop there. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm not sure whether you want to ask me any more questions or uh, just leave it to to Molly. Um, Dominic, what's your preference, or Dion? I think we should now switch over to discussion, but we can take more questions afterwards if they are. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk. We will now switch over to discussion. Uh, Molly will present some slides. And after that, Don, you will also have the opportunity to respond. Uh, Molly, whenever you're ready. Great, yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? We're good? Yep. All great. great. OK, so thanks so much, Don. And thank you to the organizers for uh, coordinating this and for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I really enjoyed um, going through this paper and, and putting this together. So when we think about spillover, we can think about it in a couple of different ways. And one is when we care primarily about direct effects, we might be worried about accounting for spillover if we're concerned that um, spillover is going to contaminate our control measurement and we're gonna get biased effect measurement. Um, but we also might care about measuring spillover as one of our primary objectives. And this might be particularly the case uh, in policy settings where um, uniform treatment, uniform compliance might not be realistic or desirable. So for example, with this film festival setting, what we want to know is not what outcomes would be if we forced everyone to watch one of these movies with the commercials. We want to know if you were to have a film festival in these communities, what's the overall impact on different sectors of society. Um, and that's a really nice feature of this experiment is this placebo design that really gets at measuring those spillovers directly and revealing them. So this kind of follows along with Nickerson 2008 that looked at inter-household spillovers with a placebo design um, as a consequence of door-to-door -door, uh, canvassing, where rather than trying to infer what strata control individuals would be in counterfactually had they received treatment, uh, it directly reveals those treatment strata. And so it makes your approach to analysis much more straightforward. And so there's a lot of appeal to using these types of design that are going to make your analysis really simple afterwards, rather than trying to try and do something fancy ex post. Uh, and as Don and Guillaume spoke about a little bit, you can think about some other approaches to these types of design where you might try and vary the treatment intensity, looking at some kind of uh, variation in environmental spillover there. And this kind of follows along with Baird et al. with their optimal design for spillovers. So I'll touch briefly on the randomization procedures, though Don did speak about those as well. So the randomization is at the village level um, because effectively it's, it's not possible to randomize at a lower level than that when you're doing these types of film festivals. But they do do this blockwise clustering where they take geographically proximate villages, put them together in a block, and then randomize at the block level. And the nice thing that that does is if there is some kind of geographical correlation of, of errors, then you're going to have a little bit better balance and hopefully get a little bit more of a precise estimate. But I'll come back to this again in a couple of slides and talk about some of the potential consequences of that as well. So I'll, I'll briefly go over the setup here. We have treatment for a given message, which is binary um, for an individual I in village J. But recall that an individual could be in treatment or control depending on what the message is. They may have received or not received a given message. And then treatment is homogenous at the village level. There is this delivery mechanism, D, which is important for understanding the setup. But practically, in this experiment, it's going to be uniform. Everyone in treatment and control gets the same delivery mechanism. And that's really essential, of course, to the design. And then we have these reachability strata, which are inherent individuals. And so in the experiment, 20% of the experiment is directly reached, 41% is indirectly reached, and 39% is unreached. So our S demand is about these stratum specific effects, which is the difference, the average difference in individual potential outcomes from having received the message or not, or being a community that was assigned the message or not, conditional on your strata. I think it's important to note that these strata are um, a function of the mechanism as well. So the authors note in their paper, if you had had the same treatment but used a different mechanism, you could get a very different reach of this intervention. And so for our overall question, which is what, what are the community level impacts or what are the overall impacts of this intervention, we really care about the distribution of those reachability strata. So if you'd used a different delivery mechanism and gotten a different distribution of those reachability strata, you could have very different overall effects, even if the 
strata conditional effect stay exactly the same. So I think it's important to know that the estimate is also implicitly a function of this delivery mechanism. And then our estimata is just this strata subsetted linear model where we have the message specific treatment and message specific outcomes. And this estimator is able to deliver to us a reliable estimate of our estimate um, dependent on a set of assumptions. So the first assumption is that strata are revealed by the treatment delivery mechanism in both treatment and control clusters. And this is basically the case by design since the researchers are defining what the strata are. And so we do have them revealed to us with this placebo design. But we also need, and this is very important, that reachability is unaffected by treatment assignment. And Don spoke about that a bit, and they do have good checks to show that there's balance across the different treatment conditions for these reachability strata. But this is something of a, a sweet spot here in that you want to have a treatment message tied with delivery mechanism that is going to be sufficiently influential that it will move attitudes of people who are exposed to it. And also, to the extent that we care about spillover, move people to have conversations with other people about this topic. But you don't want those conversations to move those other people such that they would come to the movie if they would not have otherwise. So for example, if one of the commercials was extremely controversial, if people heard about it, they might then come or not come to the next movie based on the content of that. So again, we don't see any evidence of that, that here. It looks like there's good balance. But with this type of design, that's something that you'd want to be paying attention to. We also need SIPFA, and I've given the partial interference version here. Because treatment is homogenous at the village level, what we really need is that an individual's potential outcomes do not change as a function of treatment assigned in another village. Um, and the authors ensure that villages are at least four and a half kilometers apart to try and avoid this. And the roads are pretty bad between villages, but I do think that it's possible uh, or quite plausible that people would have friends or family members, a plot of land or a reason uh, for business to go to another village and could be exposed to treatment in another village. And because we have that blocked randomized design, it means that geographically proximate villages to the village that you are in are actually more likely to be in a different treatment condition than they would have been absent that blocked randomization. So there's a potential for a little bit of bias here. I think the most likely direction of the bias is, is that it's going to bias your effect estimates towards zero. So there's something of like a bias variance trade off. You're getting more precise estimates as a consequence of this blocked randomization you might trade that for a little bit of bias to the extent that people might actually be violating the SIPA assumption and, and being exposed in other villages. So again, I don't think it's a big concern in this paper, but with this type of a design, something that you would want to be concerned about and think about in your randomization procedures. And then the no crossover effects, which John mentioned, uh, and I think are well addressed in the appendix. We don't see any evidence of those but are necessary, again, because there's that imbalance in um, treatment and control for the number of secondary videos that, that you're seeing, or secondary commercials that you're seeing. So then taking all that into account, why don't we see evidence of spillovers here? And I think that the author's uh, main justification for this is, is pretty convincing. Dramatized edutainment is effective because it is immersive, and that immersion doesn't really carry on to secondhand experience. So I, I buy that as like a, I mean, um, a main justification, but I think we could ask as well, if we had measured strata differently, is it possible that we could find different effects? And so we could imagine that there's someone who talked to a family member who had been to the film, they talked about, not about the film, and that person didn't know that they went to the film, but about the content of the commercials or the, the related topics. That person would be subject to treatment spillover, but they would not be in our indirectly reached category. So if that category is sufficiently large and if effects are sufficiently large, you might expect to see treatment effects in that unreached strata. We don't see that here. But if effects are small and there is some mismeasurement of the strata, then that might lead us more likely to, to end up with a null result. And so there are a few ways that you could think about accounting for this. I mean, you could do some type of network analysis that's going to be really expensive and uh, difficult to do, difficult to, harder to analyze. Uh, but practically, how effective that's going to be is a function of how you define those network ties as well. So you're going to come up with the same problem. I think this would actually be a really nice place for a little bit of qualitative interviews ex post, where you could ask people, you know, did you have these types of conversations with people? Who did you have conversations with about this to kind of validate how you're measuring your strata? And then lastly, thinking again about this dosage, 
could we think that if we had a higher intensity of dosage, if we had a longer duration of the film festival, would there be more opportunity for those conversations to spill over? Um, that potential potentially could lead you to find uh, spillover effects if you weren't able to find them otherwise. But again, I think if you have a longer duration, you're going to come in uh, to some more complications, including some potential uh, for contamination of people move around from village to village over longer periods of time. So just a couple of things to think about. But thank you so much, John. This is such an interesting paper, and I'm looking forward to uh, questions. Thank you, Molly. That was great. Fantastic. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Don, uh, do you want to respond? Uh, I was going to leave it to uh, Anna as well. Um, oh, okay. Anna, do you have thoughts? Um, no, I think this is uh, these comments are all very well taken. I mean, I think the um, the concern with the it's an interesting. I don't think we thought about the idea that the blocking, of course, makes Sudva a little bit more problematic in this case. I, I don't think that was something that was in our mind, but um, I think that's uh, absolutely something that someone who might implement this design again could think about the trade-off between um, this sort of geographic blocking and and having Sudva at the same time. Um, yeah, so I think all the other other points are very well taken. I think it's absolutely the case that uh, dosage might matter for um, for the extent to which these things spill over and dosage isn't super high in this particular case. I think Don talked about the question of whether we ever analyzed um, the, the degree to which dosage mattered across different um, people who attended a different number of um, sessions. And it's true that that's obviously not randomly assigned. We did look at that a little bit and it didn't seem to be the case that dosage mattered in this particular context. But of course, there's a limit to how much dosage we could expose people to with a six week um, film festival. So it's possible that a, a more intensive treatment would have other effects. In any case, thank you so much for these comments, Molly. They are really helpful. All right, great, thank you. I think you also answered almost all questions in, uh, in Q&A, or is there a new one? I think there is one more. Okay. Do you want to address it live, or otherwise I can also quickly wrap up the thing? Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot, sorry. I'll I, just... I'm just reading it now, you go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll just wrap up and then you can, you can type the answer. All right, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Don, uh, for, for the very nice presentation. Thanks, Molly, for, uh, for, the, for the great discussion. Also, thank you, Anna, for, uh, for uh, helping us out in, uh, in Q&A. Um, uh, next time, uh, we will have uh, Fan Li, who will talk about causal mediation analysis for sparse and irregular longitudinal data. Um, yeah, until then, we hope you all have a great week and hope to see you next time. Uh, Thank you all for coming. And yeah, as I said before, uh, we have a new link on the web page uh, where we ask you to uh, submit super, uh, speaker suggestions. So if you have any suggestions, yeah, please, uh, please let us know. Thank you all. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.